Hey world, welcome to another edition of Tech Deck Deck Tech, the world's best EDH deck building show featuring terrible tricks on a figure skateboard. Today, we are going to be honing in on Ororo. A while ago, I showed you my Progenitus uh, deck where the idea was basically run a bunch of group huggy stuff and enough mass removal and instant speed removal to you presume that in most games we're going to be the best situated in a kind of ramped up, roided out game of magic where everyone has access to, you know, a bunch of cards and a bunch of mana. When it worked, it was fun and it was novel, but too often I found myself just outclassed by other decks at the table, giving away free things to decks that were better anyway. And I gotta say, losing isn't that fun when you know that your deck is not as like spiky and optimized as it could be. So I recently ripped it apart, leaving together uh, what was best about it, namely all of the mass and instant speed removal. So, you know, Esper color are the best for that white, blue, black. And that was the core idea behind Alora. Before I even knew what my win condition was going to be, I knew that I wanted to run just gobs and gobs of the best removal in Magic. Now in Esper, particularly, you know, blue and black, the most straightforward and, you know, phoned in thing to do is to run a lot of, you know, card draw, counter spells and tutors and combo off at some point, but that's what I do in every deck. So I decided, I, I made a point of uh, my win condition not being a combo in this deck. So uh, what, what we have here is uh, I, what I like to call Aloro good range mid stuff. I'm gonna show you the deck in a second here, but basically all it is is a bunch of mana rocks, great removal spells, mid-range evasive beaters, and some set it and forget it card draw effects. It plays the most out of all of my EDH decks, like uh, a standard or a sealed deck. We're just playing a traditional game of magic. We leave no room for opponents to be, you know, butthurt about some stupid combo. And I would argue, particularly after, you know, the death of the partial Paris, that this strategy is, I'm sure, a little more conservative than combo. Combo is going to just win some games by default when they draw the nuts, but I would argue that this is pretty competitive. You'd be surprised as to how quickly a 5-5 in the air can, you know, kill an opponent. Despite Aloro's colors, I think that this sort of mid-range conservative strategy synergizes with what Aloro does better than combo, honestly, because Aloro is all about kind of, if you look at his text, right, incremental advantage. We're knocking down our opponent's life totals one combat step at a time while gaining life simultaneously during our upkeep and just, you know, drawing uh, one or two extra cards every turn. First things first, we do run some lands. We run 38 to be precise, five of each basic, except for swamps. We run four swamps and a bajuka bog just because it's like our only way to try and hose a graveyard based deck. These life gain lands that enter tapped, I mean, one, they're decent for fixing, and two, if we have a Loro in play, they allow us to just draw a card. Scry lands, I think, have um, gotten much better post partial Paris. You know, if you have an opening hand that only has two lands in it, but one of them's a scry land, you might be more likely to keep it because you know you can, you know, scry to try to hit that third land drop, right? Shock lands, fetch lands, pretty basic, you know, reflecting pool, exotic orchard, command tower, arcane sanctum, all makes sense. Mana confluence and city of brass are particularly good in Aloro because we're gaining life every upkeep. Yeah, just, just other kind of utility good lands, right? Good stuff. 38 lands plus 12 mana rocks equals 50 cards. Half of the deck exclusively dedicated to just generating mana. Post partial Paris, in a deck that's trying to, you know, play a longer game, I, I think that's justified. I think that half of the deck being mana is, you know, what you need to ensure that not only you have enough in your opening hand, but that you continue to draw enough to, you know, play a real game. So Soaring, obvious thought vessel, you know, with Aloro and incremental card draw, we get to a point where maximum hand size matters. Um, and then just general two mana mana rocks. Mindstone is fine, whatever. We drop it for two to ramp one and we can in a pinch later in the game sack it to draw a card. Two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock. Pristine Talisman probably wouldn't run it in most other decks, but Aloro, it basically reads tap, draw a card, each opponent loses one life, right? We gain a life when we tap it, we use the mana it generates to pay for Aloro's trigger as long as Aloro's in play. Uh, Commander Sphere is just good. Demir Bluestone, Evolution Relic's just good. Azorius Key Rune, I like this a lot because we can turn it into a flying, you know, an evasive creature and maybe strap on some sort of value equipment, a sword of some sort to, you know, get, get extra there. <laughs> uh, this is a chromatic lantern. Any deck with 
three or more colors. Ah, it's real good. This is real good. Wow. Next we have uh, 21 removal slash pseudo removal. A couple of cards aren't like exactly, you'll, you'll see what I mean. It's a lot, right? We want to play a very interactive kind of instant speed sort of break up your combo type of let's make sure this lasts until turn six kind of game, right? So, you know, path to exile is good. Swords is good. Uh, Pongify and rapid hybridization, I think are almost as good as these two, right? They're one mana, instant speed, destroy a creature. I mean, granted, they're not exiling them. So uh, Arcane Denial, we don't run a whole lot of counter magic, but counter magic that replaces itself is A-OK -okay in my book. Um, Cyclonic Rift is a must include. Dawn Charm, this was actually included to me as a bonus in a Puka trade. I don't know how I overlooked this card. You know, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. So it's a fog, or it regenerates one of our mid-range beaters, or it counters a spell that targets us. That's... Really, that's such good utility. Yeah. Baleful Strix, this one is in the pseudo-removal category, but if we cast this and then opponents don't attack us because we have a Death Touch Flying Blocker, that's as good as casting Pongify on there, whatever might have come our way. Uh, Oblation is one of the best removal spells in the format. It hits any permanent other than a land. Uh, Mortify is really capsized, it's just good. Dream Fracture, a counter spell that replaces itself, like I said. Mystical Teachings, this is another pseudo, it's not a removal spell in and of itself, but it will almost all always fetch us up something and you know past turn seven or turn eight we're gonna have enough mana to fire this off and fire off whatever you know we, we tutor for with it so and the flashback is just icing on the cake aetherize this is one of the best um answer spells in my mind to lethal on board swing from an opponent obviously it just returns all their creatures to their hand and sets them back a turn or two or three utter end hits anything uh reigns of power is at worst a fog and at best can outright win games if an opponent has a huge board just take their creatures and you know knock them or one of your other opponents out like clutch of the undercity hits any permanent for four mana, or you know, usually more relevantly, it has a transmute cost of three that we can use to grab, you know, a reins of power, or you know, the utter end, or aetherize, or mystical teachings. Although that might be a little stupid, or a four drop mid range beater, which there are plenty of in this deck, as you will see. Salumgar's so command. I was debating with my friends last night as to whether or not this is worth the five mana cost, and I think it is. A negate counter target non creature spell is relevant in every single game and getting you know either bounce a permanent or killing a you know creature with toughness three or less or destroying a planeswalker you're almost always going to get uh, a two for one so those are the instant speed responses i also run three just kind of board resets the first version of this deck ran a lot more of these but as we went in more of a you know kind of mid-rangey direction um <laughs> i stopped wanting to blow up my own board so you know, these do offer some utility we can normally avoid blowing up our four drops and five drops and degree of pain well it does blow up our four drops and five drops but at the very least we are drawing a card for every creature on the battlefield which puts us in a much better position I, in most games to rebuild faster than our opponents next up we have these uh, set it and forget it card draw effects and I, I count Aloro as one of these you know put him in play we set it and we you know, basically forget he's there we pay one every upkeep to draw an extra card but uh, on top of that um, Sensei's Divining Top just a staple uh, Ristic Study the definition of set it and forget it we put it out and if opponents mess up we're gonna to draw lots of cards. Um, Phyrexian Arena also set it and forget it, and Underworld Connection is just a slightly worse Phyrexian Arena. Again, we don't care much about the loss of one life because Aloro is, you know, making sure we have plenty of extra. Um, Sphinx's Revelation is just kind of too good to pass up in Aloro um, because we're also running Alhamrit's Archive, and this is, you know, draw two times X. It's not as many card draw effects as, you know, I, I would typically run in a blue deck, but because we're mid-range and because we're also in black-white, we have really strong top decks and, you know, just incremental value, turn by turn, uh, we, 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 we get there. All of which brings us to uh, these mid-range beaters you've been hearing so much about. In the initial version of the deck, you know, I, I didn't even really have a win condition. I just knew I wanted to run Aloro, you know, Esper, lots of removal, be interactive throughout the game, and I, I like, shoehorned in some seven drops and eight drops, like fatties, to try to, you know, close out games, but they were too slow, um, and this path, uh, is is it's just so much easier to win games with. A clever impersonator can be a copy of any of these things. Um, Argent Sphinx, like none of these on their own are that exciting. It, it, the most relevant bit is this is a 4-3 flyer. This is a 4-4 four, four flyer for four. This is a 6-6 six, six flying trample for four. Yes, my opponents can't lose the game and I can't win, <laughs> but uh, typically this is can be dealt with by ourselves before that uh, or when that becomes an issue, I should say. Uh, the Hunted Lamasu, I really like this card for command 
Alexander because if you you can give it to an opponent who's not a threat and you can kind of tag team uh, someone else who is, right? You get a 5-5 flyer, they get a 4-4 on the ground kind of horror and you just swing it in at the most threatening opponent for 9 every turn. Normally, the gift, as it were, doesn't come back to bite you. Um, Angelic Field Marshal, Lieutenant. Oh, this is just so good. A 5-5 flyer for 4 that gives my creatures vigilance if I control a Loro. I mean, without a Loro, you're not quite as good, but we can cast her one turn and then the next turn when she's ready to attack, we can cast a Loro more often than not. Um, Blood Gift Demon getting into the 5 drops. Uh, it's just another, what is it, Phyrexian Arena, right? We can draw a card, lose a life, and have a 5-4 flyer. Excellent. We'll take it. Sturmgeist is great. Usually it's a fat beater and it draws us a card whenever it connects with an opponent. It's that, you know, incremental value I keep talking about. Demon of Wailing Agonies, again, just value. It's a, you know, 4-4 four, four flyer for 5 or a 6-6 six, six flyer for 5 that makes opponents sacrifice a creature when it connects with them. That's very really good. Archfiend of Depravity, you know, basically the same idea. Really hoses token decks. Baneslayer Angel, I mean, 5-5 five, five flyer uh, that also has lifelink, which will trigger a Loro, which is... And Demons and Dragons are relevant more often than you think. Although, the flip side of that is if an opponent takes control of this, we actually run, you know, some demons in the deck and it can kind of bite us. But anyway, uh, Dromar the Banisher, oh, I guess we run some dragons too. Um, it, it costs six mana. It's getting past the point of mid-range. I guess in the context of EDH, this might still qualify. But six, six flyer for six that can bounce all creatures of a color when it connects. Hard to pass that up. And then, yeah, these are definitely not mid-range, I guess, but we run the original Eldrazi Titans that are legal in the format just because when all else fails, these can close out games on their own. <laughs> I mentioned that the first version of this deck was just like the super fat flyers that were too mana intensive to be tenable. So when I switched to a more of a mid-range strategy, I realized that equipment made so much sense because we can, you know, attach something to a mid-range flyer and it basically becomes whatever that you know, seven or eight drop would have been. And uh, we can attack the turn that we attach the equipment if the creature's been in play for a turn and if they deal with the creature somehow, which happens, we still have the equipment, which is, you know, half of the battle anyway. So, this is all I have left in the deck. Um, Swift Foot Boots, Lightning Greaves, first of all. Sword of the Animist, again, we're a non-green deck that likes to attack. This card is so good! Rogue's Gloves, all my creatures fly, so if I equip this to him, you know, that's incremental card draw sort of value. Fire Shrieker, I mean, first of all, Fire Shrieker plus Rogue's Gloves is really good. Or the Sturmgeist, or, you know, we have a few uh, triggers on uh, damage. If we have a Loro in play and a Life Linker, not to mention that Loxodon Warhammer can give Life Link, you know, that's two Aloro triggers. We can pay one for each. Um, Sword of Vengeance just kind of turns everything into a wannabe a chroma. And the Sword of Feast and Famine, I would probably run more of, you know, this cycle of swords if I owned more of them. But this one, I, it's one of the better ones for command anyway. It uh, untaps all of our lands when we connect. Also forces the opponent to discard, but untapping all of our lands, that's huge. We get another turn, basically. It's like a time walk. One quick note before we get to the gold fishing section. This deck is like a little out of my wheelhouse. It's not my traditional play style. So, you know, I'm always looking forward to your feedback, of course. You guys are very smart. But for this deck in particular, like, I really do want your advice uh, to help make it better, but still, you know, doing you know, the things that I described as, you know, wanting to do with this deck. So if there's a card that seems like obvious that should be in here that I just don't know about, uh, let me know. Or you know, if there's some angle that you don't like or some card in here that you don't like, let me know. Like, leave, leave a comment. Let's, let's, let's converse digitally, right? And let's goldfish! Woo! We're all shuffled up. Let's do our mulligans here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I think we have to pitch this because we only have two lands. Yes, we have a mana rock, but they're both black. The center's tapped and we have, like, blue answers. So I just, you know, I think we can do better than that. That's, that looks a lot better. It's gonna be a little hard to goldfish a Rhystic study. <laughs> We're just gonna have to kind of treat it like a howling mine, I guess. We have four lands in our opening hand. We're gonna refill our hand with that, and we're gonna have early game uh, answers to, you know, opponents who are trying to blast off too soon, and a way to just refill in a big way. Yeah, 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 yeah. We turn one here, we will draw a Fire Shrieker. Okay, whatever, we will play a City of Brass. We're at 42 life, probably, and we'll take our second turn. We will draw an Azorius Key Rune. Good, we are missing a Mana Rock from our hand. Um, we will play a Plane as our land for turn, and we'll pass. We'll move on to turn three. We will draw for turn. We'll draw an Aether Eyes. That's good news. And I think here, if we have Rhystic Study in our opening hand, this is the one exception to the always play your mana acceleration first. We want to just make sure that we catch opponents while they're trying to build their initial board and have to let us draw a card. So let's assume that this draws us you know, just one extra card during opponent's turns. Uh, so that's our you know, Psycrypt, decent. And then we'll draw for turn four. 
It'll land, that's fine. Now we'll drop our Esper Panorama, and for three, ouch, we're gonna play the Azorius Key Rune, and I think that's everything. Yeah, probably during an opponent's end step before our turn, after we've drawn one from Mystic Study, Swift Foot Boots, uh, we're gonna crack the Esper Panorama. Going into turn five, you can already see this kind of incremental advantage that we are building. We're going to draw a Pongify. We're going to play a land for turn. I think the best play here is to simply tap Reliquary Tower and a Plains to drop our, our Swift Foot Boots and hold up, you know, whatever answers the situation might call for. We're at the point where opponents might be starting to do some uh, pretty scary things. So, yeah, let's let's say that they do. Let's say that we have to arcane denial something, but that they're being smart and they're beginning to pay for our risk study when they have a man available. Uh, so uh, we will draw an extra card off the Arcane Denial. Cool, we have a Sword of the Animist. And then, uh, yeah, let's say that's it. We'll go to our sixth turn and draw Baleful Strix. That is a thing of beauty right there. So our turn six play is going to be casting a Baleful Strix. We'll take one damage from City of Brass. We've been gaining life from Aloro, by the way. I'm just... <laughs> it's easy to forget, so if you play with this deck, don't forget, alright? We're hoping we draw a land, because without a land drop for this turn that enters untapped also, um, we're not going to be able to equip the Swift Foot Boots, giving haste, and cast and equip the Sword of the Animus to start ramping really crazy for <laughs> an Esper deck. So, trigger! We draw big money, big money, no whammies, and... Not a land, but a Dawn Charm, we'll, we'll take that. Bit of a bummer, and if we keep getting mana screwed, we're going to want to cast Aloro pretty soon to, you know, just get our personal Howling Mind really online. But I think what we do here is we pay two, we cast the Sword of the Animist regardless, and then we leave two mana up so that we can Pongify or Dawn Charm or Cyclonic Rift um, in response to something an opponent does. Now let's go ahead and say that we do fire off the Pongify, okay. But as a consolation, they don't pay one. And we get a Stern Geist. Ooh, that's cool. Turn, give me that seven here. We are going to draw for turn a land. That's cool, it gains us life, and I don't think we're going to get the uh, Aloro trigger because we're going to want to play that right now. But regardless, we'll gain our third life for turn. And think, 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 think. You know, it's a beautiful thing that we can pay one, two mana to equip our Baleful Strix with Sword of the Animist, swing in to ramp once off of this trigger, and still have four mana up, enough to Aetherize or Dawn Charm and or Cyclonic Rift, right? So we'll ramp once here. We're gonna grab a, uh, probably a Swamp. Chugga chugga. <laughs> and we'll say an opponent tries to attack us while our blocker is tapped, and we're gonna Aetherize all their crap. Eighth turn, this is gonna be the last turn that I show you, just because this deck is designed to play slightly longer games, and we're not gonna hit any sort of conclusive board state, but you get a general idea. We'll draw for turn a planes that's excellent news that leaves us with one two three four five six seven eight nine mana enough to do neat things the first thing we want to do is pay one two three blue blue like so and drop the Sturmgeist uh, and then for one white mana we'll equip the Sturmgeist with the swift foot boots uh, we will move to combat we will get Two triggers, one on the attack to tutor for a land, and one on the Sturmgeist one we connect to draw. I'm gonna shortcut it and draw now and get the land after. So then we just sit back, uh, three mana up, enough to Psych Rift and or Dawn Charm, and uh, we're starting to get a scary Sturmgeist. We're gonna drop the Fire Shrieker next turn, which is gonna give the Sturmgeist double strike and draw us two cards and make him that much bigger. We're gonna ra continue ramping, continue drawing off of Rhystic Study. This is, uh, it gets there. It really does get there, even though it's not a combo deck. That is all she wrote for me for today. Thank you very much for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, I would highly encourage you to subscribe to Pogo Bat Gaming. And if you've been digging it, uh, I would encourage you to contribute on Patreon to help me in my new media endeavors. Just giving a dollar a month. It's a bargain. Uh, it goes a long way towards making sure I'm able to continue making sweet deck techs and uh, more politically oriented content, if that's uh, something you're into, on my primary channel. That's youtube.com slash pogobat. So anyway, much love, peace, happiness, and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week.